Hello everybody, it's time to start unit number 16. It will be again two parts and we will make progress on the mathematical foundations of signal processing, which for me means that we have to learn some of the function spaces and some of the functional analytic tools and tricks in order to comfortably and mathematically correct deal with Dirac measures, Dirac combs, Fourier transform, without using uh, integrals, because we have seen already that the Lebesgue integral is a nice thing, but it's not allowing you to show the inverse Fourier transform of a constant one of a character, which of course should be back uh, the Dirac measure that we had as a starting point. The setting of C0 and M infinite, M, the bounded measures as a dual space was quite nice to characterize Bibo systems meaning bounded linear operators from C0 to C0. And composition for these things turned into multiplication by convolution of bounded measures. We have also seen that these operators are not only defined on C0, but can be extended to the bounded continuous functions. Hence, it's reasonable to apply them to pure frequencies, these exponential functions with purely imaginary exponent. And we have seen that there are common eigenvectors and that the diagonalization on this kind of, one has to be careful, kind of continuous basis, um, we can uh, describe it as uh, the free transform as a diagonalization of all these invariant systems. But we see more and more different settings. Now, the disadvantage of C0 MB duality is that none of the spaces is contained in the other. Even L1 functions don't have to be continuous, they don't have to decay. And uh, in, of course, C0 functions decay at infinity, but maybe very slow, like the sync function, without being integrable or defining a bounded measure. Therefore, it's quite important to have smaller spaces where the original space can be embedded into the dual space. This harmless trick would be L1 intersected the continuous function. So you take the intersection of the two spaces, then of course you can embed it in the dual space. But this space is not very nice for um, Fourier transform. So continuity is not translating into any reasonable condition on the Fourier transform side. Therefore, we have to use certain amalgam spaces. And in order to learn about how the amalgamation works, we we're having two examples, the Wiener algebra, or the space which is locally like C0, but globally glued together in an absolutely convergent manner. And um, I'm starting with by showing you uh, the definition of the norm on the Wiener space. So you see here uh, in blue, the absolute value of a band limited signal actually. So I was creating by random Fourier coefficients smooth functions and you see the spikes here they are coming because I didn't plot the x-axis so it's an absolute value of a smooth function and then we try to dominate it by a step function. Now strictly speaking the norm uh, with the with the amalgam space should be taken with respect to a bupu which is supposed to be continuous but here you may take the exception of just take boxcar functions and you see their equal lengths constant and always within that interval where the green line is constant, it takes the value which is the maximal value of the blue curve which is dominated. So this is the norm, the green, the, the area under the green graph, so to say, is the norm in the Wiener algebra. So you see it's more sensitive to tiny spikes because the L1 norm just computes the area but you can make a triangular function, which is very, very narrow, which has a very small L1 norm, but uh, still rather big uh, amalgam norm because you count, you sum up all the maxima. So this is giving you the idea of the discrete version of the norm. And uh, I will jump now to the script. I have extended the script quite a bit uh, and I'm going now to the current version of the script uh, to page 111, which we had already more or less. I was quickly mentioning earlier that it might be a better idea instead of going kind of from box to box 
to move this local maximal function constantly in a smooth or continuous manner over the real line. So we have a general definition. If you're giving me any algebra as we had it before, and for us C0 or the Fourier algebra FL1 will be the nice example. So you choose any localizer. I would recommend to think of the phi as a trapezoidal function in the Fourier algebra. We know it's in the Fourier algebra because it's a convolution product of two box functions, so a convolution product of two L2 functions, so it will be uh, by Plancheret's theorem uh, in the Fourier algebra, and it has compact support. So what does uh, the inner part do? It cuts out in a constant way out of the function f, which can grow or, or any, any continuous function. It takes out the localized part centered around set. So think of a trapezoidal function maybe supported on minus one plus one and with the plateau, um, well, very close to the boundary. Then you measure the content of the function f in the range of around set minus one to set plus one. Now, the B means you can measure it in many different ways. We take the sup norm, we take the Fourier algebra norm. Later on, you can take LP norms, you can take BS of space norm. There are a lot of such norms. So you're checking what is the local size of this function. For example, you can think of maybe of a Sobolev space later on that measures smoothness by taking differentiation. You can take uh, the measure the derivative and the maximal value of the derivative. So how steep the function is, plus of course the maximal value of the original function. So there are a lot of choices. Now, what we claim without proving details at the moment, but I would like to mention it right now is that this continuous norm is equivalent to the, to the discrete norm. So here you're measuring in a constant way moving around in RD. Maybe in, you think of the plane, you're having a kind of uh, looking glass and you move it around the plane, but you integrate all your observations over the thing. This K is a norm, so it's a non-negative function. So there is no, no uh, absolute value necessary. You're just taking the L1 norm in the, in the integration sense. Now, this is the reason why sometimes uh, I was, I'm using, or in the literature, you find uh, symbols like it's a Wiener amalgam space with local component A and script L1 or L2. But these script spaces don't have inclusion results like the sequence spaces. Therefore, I think it's more convenient to think of these L1, L2 discrete spaces. But, and that's the reason why I recall this to you, is um, this here is giving you a norm which is isometric invariant and the translation. There is no box, there is no splitting into boxes of something living in one box after it is, after shift split up into pieces. And that's why this equivalent norm, having the same limits and all the things, um, is sometimes more convenient, more elegant. Now, if you might have looked up uh, the space in the literature, you might have found completely, at first sight, completely different characterizations. I would just like to recall to you that with this continuous norm in our concrete situation where A is the Fourier algebra, you uh, get um, this following norm. So choose any function G which is in L1 and has, uh, which is band limited in L1. That means it has a full transform, which is compactly supported. So if you take such a function, we know that you can convolve any L1 function uh, with, uh, or you can convolve any bounded continuous function. Let's say F is, you start from L1, you take those functions in L1 where after convolving the full transform, which is a decent function in C0, with the modulated version over G, you get an integrable function, number one, and that integral now running over all the frequencies is going uh, to be integrable. Now, this will be studied also later on in some form, but it's like you're having a, a Gauss current, for example. No, it's not good. Uh, you take maybe the sink square function which is band limit, it has a Fourier transform, which is the delta, the big delta, the triangular delta. 
and you modulate it. So you have an oscillatory function. And this oscillation means that this function is decaying. And the more smoothness you have, the better you will see the decay. So it's this expression is measuring the decay. So how fast will this norm decay if you make the frequencies smaller and smaller? And so it's a natural condition. Now, it's in this form, it's surprising that the space is invariant of the Fourier transform. Uh, but we have already established the Fourier transform, and I claim that this is an equivalent norm. Therefore, to say f is in that space or f hat is in the space is the same. So this is now uh, another condition that you say a function from L1, then MSGs in L1 can be convolved with another L1 function measured in L1. If it has the property that these expressions are integrable with respect to the frequency variable. Uh, now, this is something which shows you the behavior of the smooth function under um, uh, convolution with a modulated kernel. And that's why spaces where you have maybe not the L1 norm here, maybe not the L1 norm or in, in, with respect to S, but some different letters are called modulation spaces. They have been introduced after the introduction of S0 as Wien amalgam spaces. It's just to give you a hint to the literature. So um, we will see L2. The L2 norm is being something where you can take a local L2 norm of such a function, and then you take a square integrable um, integral over the frequency variable. So yes, um, the Siegel algebra is zero, is an amalgam space, but this is also a special case of the modulation spaces. So the main point is, that if you're, uh, uh, okay, I, I think I forgot to mention this, that uh, if you translate this uh, in a different form, then you will see that you get a, a connection to the short time Fourier transform. Well, maybe it's uh, worthwhile to stop it and go back to the other script, which is just the script of the, uh, the original script where uh, the same space is introduced, you see in my, my plots, by the short time free transform. And I hope I can show it to you in a moment, yeah. So maybe uh, just to show you this uh, characterization, continuous characterization, which has a double integral, can be converted into integrability of the short time Fourier transform of a function f with respect to a window g. So let me just explain this expression a little bit. You can start maybe from functions in the Wiener algebra or so, uh, because that would not be a restriction. Then f and g would be nice integrable bounded functions. The product would be bounded and integrable. So you can define the Fourier transform in the ordinary sense. This is exactly more or less the condition on the localization. You have your signal f, and you're localizing with a, maybe a moving Gauss function in this case. And then you localize, and then you do frequency analysis of this localized part. So you have a function which is called the voice transform. This reminds you of voices, octave, of frequencies, and so on, of the signal f with respect to the window g at the point x and omega, which is a point in the time frequency plane. Uh, of course, if we take a two-dimensional situation, then x would be a location in the image. So you would localize your image and you, you would analyze a zebra by saying, well, in this area, the stripes are very much, omega would be a direction now, directional vector. In this place, uh, maybe at the belly of the zebra, the stripes are in a certain direction, which is described by a large value of the short time Fourier transform in the two dimensional sense. So for me, it's only important that you can rewrite this short time Fourier transform as a kind of a scalar product between the function f that has to be analyzed and, uh, and uh, uh, using a window. And of course, it's reasonable to find the information at the place where you expect it that the g itself is well localized in time and frequency. So either you're taking maybe a B-spline, which is compactly supported, but 
well concentrated in frequency, or you take a Gauss function, which is kind of the optimal object in this respect. We may not have time to do this in detail, but uh, the integrability of the short-term Fourier transform is just another form of this continuous control function being integrable. So it's one integral to have the L1 norm and one integral to integrate over phase space. So it's an integral over the uh, phase space domain. And it has very nice properties, very similar actually also for a proof uh, to the Plasher theorem, or it uses the Plasher theorem saying that now you're producing maybe with one window, G1 equals G2 being the Gauss function, and you're producing from an audio signal, which is a one dimensional signal, not only a time and a frequency representation, but a time frequency representation. And uh, this is like a picture, but the scalar product of this picture, meaning again, you integrate over time frequency, taking the first one against the second one conjugate is the same as the product of this one dimensional scalar products between the two signals and the one dimensional uh, scalar product between the two windows. So either you're saying it's G2 with G1, you switch the order or you take, keep the order G1, G2 and take a conjugation. So this is just, because we would like to continue uh, with these characterizations later on. But now I'm going to, to, to the details of, of the uh, extra notes. Okay, uh, um, I'm just jumping now through the material because this is something that is a bit redundant. Meanwhile, I have put a lot of text, which I don't need to explain. First, I was recalling in this chapter the properties of the Wiener algebra, so that it has nice properties that I don't know, it's continuously embedded into L1, but also in C0. And therefore, later on, we'll see it's embedded into its dual space. Uh, translations are isometric, uh, no, are uniformly bounded. And that's the kind of the bottleneck where I said, no, let's take an equivalent norm with a continuous control function, then this will be isometric. And because compactly supported functions are dense, shift is a continuous thing. These two properties are coming in recurrently. We know them from C0 already. We know them from L1, more or less by definition. We know them for the Wiener algebra, and we know it for S0, where you take locally the Fourier algebra. These properties actually imply already that you can convolve with bounded measures also, this will be verified more or less by proving that deep psi mu convolved with f and you expect, well, this is a discrete measure. This gives us sum of translates. And yes, they are a Cauchy sequence or a Cauchy net. If you make your partitions of unity finer and finer, so you're thinking of finer and finer histograms describing your measure, and you do the convolution in a discrete way, that will have a limit and that limit is not something strange, but it's just what you would call mu with f. And we had a discussion already that the different realizations that we had, here I'm using a description uh, as a Cauchy sequence in, the, in some other Banach space, but they're all equivalent. And, um, and uh, I will kind of uh, give a short comment. So we had a little interruption uh, but now I'm continuing with another subject. And this is uh, the so-called Wiener's inversion theorem. If we think of, uh, of uh, the, okay, sorry, of, yeah, maybe I'm jumping right to, to the statement. If you think of a convolution operator, which is coming from an L1 function, so you're uh, applying it to um, a C0 of, uh, space, or later on, we will do it on L2 or other function spaces, then you can ask yourself, well, maybe I have an invertible operation. So maybe I can retrieve the input from the output. And uh, the answer is no, this will not be possible. And very simply because of the riemann lebesgue lemma. Assume somebody has filtered, that's the standard engineering terminology, 
the input signal by convolving with some L1 function G. That means, of course, that uh, if you apply it to decent functions, which are having an L1 Fourier transform, that you have multiplied with a function decaying to zero. So if you would like to recover it by doing something with a smart uh, deconvolver, uh, then you would have to have a function which tends to zero, but uh, which has to the, have the property that you multiply the two together, that you get the function which is constant one, which is clearly impossible. So it seems like there is information lost. Now, of course, you can convolve with a function which is band limited. Um, that means, uh, let's say the Fourier transform is a triangular function, then clearly everything outside of the support of the Fourier transform of your, outside of the support of your transfer function will be killed. So again, no hope to recover that information, but you could say, well, maybe for those parts where the transfer function is non-zero, we could try to recover. So we have a deformation and it's like in audio, you, you're having a recording and you're setting uh, your, your profile to, I don't know, to rock and you're making your bus stronger and maybe damp the middle frequencies or you're having a recording where you think you understand better if you reduce the high and the low frequencies and emphasize the middle frequencies. So it would be a situation where nothing would be put to zero, but um, so somehow where the inversion at the transfer space level is okay. But if the original function is in L1, can we hope that the, the, the inversion is possible also in the, by some L1 function? That's kind of a, actually a hard question or so. I'm not giving a proof of this. It's also, it's in chapter one of Hans Reiter's book, of my advisor's book, but I will give you an idea of how it can, how you can think of it. So the correct statement is, even if um, the uh, operator itself, a convolution operator by an L1 function is not invertible, it is partially invertible over compact domains in the frequency domain. So we start by looking at the function G, which is non-zero over a certain frequency band. Think of, you, this has to be a compact set, otherwise it's not possible. Um, or yeah, okay. uh, it, it, it will have to stay bounded away from, from, from origin. So we have a continuous function, which is non-zero on a compact domain. And there is a theorem, the minimum maximum theorem saying that such a function will have a minimum. So you're staying away from the dangerous zero which of course makes problems for inversion. And then the claim of Venus inversion theorem is the following. There is another function G also in L1, so which is well localized and actually approximable then by discrete measures living in a compact support such that you have uh, the product of these two functions is just one or the new one is just inverting the original one. I will make use of this in, an, in one more characterization of the space as zero, which was an early uh, situation, but uh, uh, well, I don't uh, give you many details. I just mentioned that in the proof, you need that the area preserving, the L1 norm preserving stretching and compression operator, which I call ST, is an automorphism for convolution, that's mean means if you compress a box function, for example, to a small box function, and then you convolve two small box functions, you will get the same as convolving the two things, which is a triangular function, and then you compress the triangular function. So it's just always the area preserving property, which allows you to in the, well, change the order of either convolving the two guys, or, or you could also say, it doesn't matter whether you measure your functions in centimeter or, or, or uh, uh, inch. In each case, you can relabel it. And if you do it properly in the L1 norm so that you, you count the area and, and get the same result by taking care of the units, then you get the same convolution. Now, the other idea, which is in the background, which is used, and I'm not, really not going into details is that the inverse one over this can be written locally as a power series. So we are essentially saying, 
one over x or one over z is an analytic function and you try to compose the Fourier transform, which is some guy like this, with an analytic function. And uh, in this game, uh, the technical argument comes in and I just want to tell it to you is, if you take the closed ideal, which is called I zero of all the functions which have a Fourier trans in L1, which have a Fourier transform vanishing at zero. So the, the ones which have mean value zero. But this, well, you can say it's a crazy closed subspace of L1. You can multiply two functions, one from L1, one from this space. You get, of course, by the com um, convolution theorem, f hat multiplied with g hat. If one of them is zero, the product will be zero. The claim is you can have bounded approximate units in this norm. So you can find, um, if you give me finitely many elements in this space and any positive number, I can fabricate for you a function which is also having integral zero. And if you apply it, it's like an approximate unit, but we had always the condition that an approximate unit has to have area one. So it had to have the condition g hat of zero equal uh, one. And here you have a condition where it's zero. And actually the trick is to have two parts, the g which is going to the Dirac measure, and the other part which is kind of st rho for rho to infinity. So have a very, very flat version of the, of the same, which together gives of course uh, the zero here. And then you take a big uh, mean value over a function which has integral zero. So it will be a very tiny function. So it's kind of using twice the ST row trick that we have, um, but now with this other side condition. I just wanted to mention this because probably eventually I will make use of this, but I think it's not important. It's good to know this uh, result, but uh, not important to, to know the technical details. Yeah, okay. Um, now we are jumping to the, to the uh, Siegel algebra is zero, which is locally Fourier algebra globally L1. And we had already the list of the, all these properties. I would like to mention that um, we can take arbitrary uh, approximate units from the L1 case. So it can be a Gauss function, a box function, a triangular function, just compressed. Let it act on the space. It will be in a zero. And the important thing is, uh, Whereas you have a kind of a loose convergence in L1 for L1 functions, now for the functions which are better, which are from this nice subspace, the convergence will be much more settled. So you have uniform convergence, L1 convergence, even LP convergence for NP and so on. And uh, I was adding a little result because I found that might be useful. Uh, this is a new text here, corollary. And if, if you give me any band limited function in L1, then it will belong to that Siegel algebra. Moreover, you can control the norm in a uniform way. That means for all the functions where the support, uh, yeah, yeah, here it says, where the support of the Fourier transform of F is inside a compact interval, let's say maximal free in the real line, maximal frequency, uh, non-vanishing for is plus minus 10, then you can choose a constant depending only on the size of the spectrum such that you control the normally more sensitive norm as zero norm with this norm. So the other estimate controlling the L1 norm by the zero norm is kind of easy. So you can say, if you restrict your attention to functions which are not too rough, then actually the L1 norm and the zero norm are equivalent. But of course, if you are not having this restriction, this uh, estimate is not true. And it's also clear if you make M bigger and bigger, that constant will blow up as we will see in, in a moment. It's more to, to show you the kind of arguments that we would like to use also in the future. Okay, so we are um, starting or you're giving me such, uh, well, no, well, in order to, to show the estimate, uh, do these role games all the time. Uh, I suggest that we fix a set M compact, maybe an interval minus 100 to plus 100 or a, a finite a rectangle in the in two dimensional case, compact set in the frequency domain. 
and you're allowed to give me any function uh, in L1 of, of the RD, which has a free transform only with non-zero values inside this set. And I have to show you how I can control this zero norm. Now, because we have agreed on the, on the set M, uh, I can say, well, for, for this set, I can find a trapezoidal function, which is uh, in the Fourier algebra as we know, and uh, it's con compactly supported. So I'm kind of uh, suggesting to have the intuition in 1D, but of course in 2D, you would have a tensor product one trapezoidal function in the x and the other in the y direction and to take this product and by higher you go by induction. Now, because this is in the Fourier algebra and has compact support, it is in S0, that's important. Therefore, forward inverse Fourier transform are no problem in the pointwise sense. And so we can take the inverse Fourier transform and I call it variable phi. Now, since we have f hat, it's completely concentrate, it's only non-zero on the set M, I can multiply it with the tau and it will be reproduced. Now, essentially the point is to see how you can use only the billing blocks without much thinking anymore. If you're seeing a pointwise relationship, you can go to the inverse free transform and you go back to F, has to be F equals phi convolved with F. Just we're checking. On the full transform side, you would get F hat. On the other side, it would be the convolution theorem. So F goes to F hat and phi goes to phi hat, which by definition is our tau. And point was uh, convolution goes to point was multiplication. So very easy. Okay, once you write it in this X way algebraically, you can say, well, this was in S0 and the other was one in, in L1. We don't have to take care of the order. so involving a bounded measure, if you want, with a zero, you will end up in a zero. So yes, it means we are already in a zero, but how can we estimate the norm? And of course, we, we do it by estimating this product. You take the a zero norm of the guy phi here, but this is actually the same as the a zero norm of tau. If we have a fully invariant norm, otherwise you might get a constant. And then you're taking the L1 norm of this here. So this is kind of the norm in estimate for this inclusion is applied and you get the constant, which is good for every F because we have not used any particular property of F except that it's in L1. And so it has a Fourier transform in the ordinary sense and the support is in this. So this was uh, a technical result, which will be useful later on. Um, I'm trying to see if I can jump directly now. Yeah. Uh, to Poisson's formula, this is more or less where we are have stopped last time. So uh, there was a new material in the meanwhile, but, and um, I will try to show you that Poisson's formula is valid for a zero functions. Actually for, uh, we, do, we write the proof for the one dimensional case, but it's valid for any uh, lattice as we will mention right later on. Now, I have told you that there is a free transform in the dual space and it says, if you give me a functional or a, yeah, a linear functional on such a Banach space, then it has a free transform sigma hat of F is a sigma applied to F hat. So just in the jointness relationship. So if you, look up the definition of the Fourier transform of the Sha distribution. I call sigma the Sha distribution, the sum over the deltas. So it's also the Dirac comp. And then this relationship turns out to be just the statement that the Fourier transform of the Sha, of the Dirac comp is the Dirac comp. And I always mention here that the e to the two pi i in the exponent is helping you to have the same integer lattice here and no constants and so on. If somebody says, well, this is already known from Schwartz's theory of tempered distributions, then I would like to remind you that in the spirit of Schwartz, the same formula is true, but it's equivalent to the statement here, not for F in the whole space as zero, 
but only for these rapidly decreasing functions, which are infinitely differentiable or so. So it's a much smaller set and reservoir. We are allowed to take piecewise linear triangular, I mean, triangular functions and piecewise linear integrable functions in a zero, which are far away from Schwartz functions. So we have a fairly big reservoir where we can do this. Also, um, there is a joke saying that this formula is not always true. And it simply means if you're discarding this extra condition, if you're not requiring f to be in a zero, you're not safe anymore. You may be lucky um, or kind of you may be dis disappointed because you find that this is convergent, the right-hand side is convergent, but they're not equal. So this can happen. It has been explored in the 90s. And there are a lot of counterexamples, but uh, all the counterexamples or let's say all the sufficient conditions which guarantee that everything is okay are in fact sufficient conditions for being in that space. So if you see something like this, try to prove that you are inside a zero and inside a zero, everything is relatively easy to prove. Okay, now uh, I was stopping last time near the point where we were proving uh, this here. And the idea was, uh, is, or is always the following kind of, where you see already the role of the Dirac comb in the background of the proof of Poisson's formula. So we're in the middle of the proof of Poisson's formula for the one dimensional case, because it's easier to illustrate. We are producing a periodic version of the function f, uh, which is maybe look at the right hand side. Uh, yeah, I see there, it should be uh, f of t minus x, and this should be the convolution product at the point t. So you take your f, you're shifted by one, two, three, minus one, minus two, and you add up all these copies. And clearly there is an issue about the convergence. Is it convergent? But if you kind of look what you have here, uh, maybe you look at the point or at a small interval, what happens on the, on the unit interval? Then you will see you're piling up pieces uh, from from different intervals, more or less. You're piling up the piece between zero and one, then you come with the piece between one and two and two and three and so. And by definition, exactly the soup of all these things was, was uh, finite. So you can say we're having locally, if you localize everything to some big interval, then you will get an absolutely convergent sum. So it's nicely convergent. So point-wise, everything is fine. So we get the periodic function. Now, uh, I was already indicating or telling you uh, this theory of Fourier series theory of periodic functions. And this, uh, actually, the proof that I'm giving right now was the reason why I had to first uh, derive a little bit about discrete measures on the integers uh, and a classical Fourier series from our fundamental relationship, because normally people would say, well, we have done a whole chapter on classical Fourier analysis or so. And I had to derive this, so here we are. So this periodic function can be described, uh, can be uh, re uh, reproduced by um, going into the Fourier series domain. And uh, of course, there's an I missing. So you integrate over the unit interval, actually zero, one, or minus one half. One half is the symmetric version, uh, times e to the minus two pi i kt. So there's a minus and an I missing in this version that you read here on the screen. And you get the Fourier coefficients. Now, the main point in the, the whole story, and that's why I really want to discuss it at, at, at length is the blue formula here. So we can say that these Fourier coefficients, so they are labeled with integers. They are exact of the periodic Fourier coefficients of the periodic functions derived from your f. They are exactly the sampling values of the ori original Fourier transform of f at the integers. So let us recall, we know if we start from f in a zero, the Fourier transform, will be a nice function, it will be also in a zero. So it will be continuous, also integrable, it will be in Venus algebra, but it's very nice. So sampling uh, that function is no problem. But what is the Fourier transform of this? 
and again a, a typo, it's ft with e to the minus two pi i n t. So frequency n is here. Now, the harmless trick that you're doing is split this integral into pieces. Instead of going over the whole real line, you're adding up all those integrals. Now, of course, what we know about f is justifying the convergence of the series. So we can uh, uh, be sure that these coefficients are controlled such that uh, this infinite sum is meaningful. So again, the minus is still missing, but uh, there we can do a transformation. We do a transformation from that interval. So we write instead of t, we write t minus k, and of course t minus k is moving in the zero one inter interval. Of course, also that t has to replace by t minus k. But, and that's now the second part, after having broken it, observing that n is a natural number, of course also for the minus you have here, you can uh, ignore this shift parameter because the factor is e to the two pi i n k, that's fixed product of two natural numbers. And this means you are having some full rotation, so you're ending up with one. So you can do this. And then of course you can interchange the order of the integral. And then you're saying, oh, this is the integral from zero to one. And uh, getting, I hope you don't have a specific error in, this, in the recording. There you see that you change the order. So this is really the Fourier coefficient, uh, again, with the minus of that periodic function. So it's uh, this uh, C with label N. So we have F hat is the integral with the minus, which is the Fourier coefficient. Now, we have seen that the function is in the zero, therefore the full transform is a zero, therefore it's in the Wien algebra, and therefore the samples, I mean, they contribute to the maximum of these intervals, and the sum of the maxima is summable, therefore uh, this sum will be a summable. So the full coefficients of the periodic functions, which are the samples of the original function, are in L1 because we have guys which are behaving in a nice way. So that means that periodic function is an, having an absolutely convergent Fourier series. So uh, this is also an invention of Norbert Wiener. I think at this time Fourier series theory was already developed, but they realized that for L2, maybe the convergence of Fourier series is not valid point-wise. And it took, uh, I don't know, until the 70s uh, when Carlison was proving it was a very deep technical uh, machinery that for L2 functions, you have almost everywhere convergence of the Fourier series. So if you have L1 coefficients in the Fourier expansion, the Fourier series expansion is valid and everything is fine. Now, this is the representation of a periodic function as a superposition of pure frequency in a pointwise sense. So for every y that you have this, a is a continuous function even a little bit better or so. Now, if it's true for every y, then you can put y equals zero. And then you say, well, the periodic function at zero is of course, and now you have the, this nice interpretation, is the same as the linear combination, this infinite sum, with all the pure frequencies evaluated at zero. These are expressions of the form two pi exponent something times zero, so which is one. So you get a sum of all the Cn. Okay, and all the Cns are equal to the f hat of n. That's the magic thing. Whereas what is the value of the periodic function? Well, every point had a point, uh, absolute sum, infinite sum of the point values. So this is f of k. So this is exactly how you prove Poisson's formula. And also this is the, the point, the last red formula where these counter examples come in. Because if you're only having, let's say an, a function which is square integrable and the Fourier coefficients which are square integrable, then you may have a situation where it represents the L2 function, but only almost everywhere. And then you're not allowed to take a single point um, as something which you can have. So for example, if you have a jump function, then the Fourier series will be convergent typically 
but the value will be the midpoint between the upper and the lower value of the jump. So it's maybe not the function value. So in order to have this striking inequality, you need a little bit more. And uh, I think uh, to, to view uh, S0 as the right domain for Poisson's formula is really a good idea that will be helpful for you in, for whenever you see Poisson's formula, hopefully in the future. I think I will uh, stop here uh, the first part and we should resume